Nick, welcome to Texas A&M. I am tremendously honored to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure having you. Now, you've seen sport from every angle, from on the field to the White House to around the globe. You have a very unique perspective on the sports industry. What's your, what's your take on the status of the industry, sort of a uh, State of the Union address, if you would? Well, um, there's a, a college word that I will use, which is that if there is a zeitgeist, if there is a cultural focus and intense spotlight, it absolutely is embodied and represented uh, by sports. Sports is getting more popular. Sports is becoming the social capital or glue at a higher level than it ever has been for the very reason that society and the technology that tapes this uh, interview as an example and the technology here, all those things that bring us together also separate us. Uh, and sport is the unifying um, geographical and emotional ingredient that allows people to feel like they're uh, living in a place that they can truly call home. Uh, sports helps provide that sense of belonging and it obviously has that great entertainment value and we all know that it has tremendous financial value and because of the previous two things that have to do with the geographical connection to a location and that emotional sense of home um, it's also becoming more the economic powerhouse that drives economies. It's growing at a faster rate probably than anything else in the American economy. Speaking of that social capital, how do we manage that? How do we harness that as, as stewards of the industry? What should we be doing? Well, we all have an obligation, no matter what level of success we achieve, no matter what area we achieve that success in, we have an obligation uh, to ourselves to reinvest that success and that deep emotional gratification uh, in such a way that it comes back to rejuvenate our own spirit and the spirit of the schools like Texas A&M, 106,000 strong, or St. Albans School where I went, or Dartmouth where you and I both went to college, uh, to rejuvenate that spirit to not forget that without those great influences of coaches, uh, the investment the college made in us, uh, that we would not likely have achieved what we did. And so to me, as long as we remember that that social capital represents the deepest values, and the deepest values have to include reinvesting and uh, underscoring the importance of gratitude and the importance of giving back and sharing your success. So I would say that as long as in this great era of plenty where the rest of the economy is having so much trouble, where such a high percentage of people are underpaid, uh, overqualified, or out of work, where debt and credit are such huge issues, and yet in this very era of economic and financial difficulty, sports continues to thrive, it will only uh, kill the goose that laid the golden egg if it forgets that one lesson, to give back, to share, and to be the leader in every sense, to be the leader that doesn't get too big in itself, that in the end, like the Roman Empire, almost like a cliche, it will implode on itself. Yeah, we've heard a lot of commentary about um, the problems on Wall Street and uh, the mortgage crisis and so forth, largely due to the expanding gap between the CEO and the frontline workers. Right? And you get to a point where salary is 10,000 times, right? huge disconnect. Right. right. We can see, is sport potentially going that way, the disconnect between the athlete and their salary and the fans and the ticket prices? Are we, are we headed down a path? Where, what do you view about that? I believe that all of us know that whether it was a teacher, a parent, a brother, a friend, an uncle, a mentor of some kind helped us, usually after we've made the mistake, after we've thought we were all that and more, that it's empty, that there is, whether you believe in God or not, there is this part of you that cannot appreciate and enjoy it in a way that you know won't go away that can't be taken away if you don't connect it to a purpose that is higher 
than yourself. And so the athlete has the advantage at a young age to get attention, to get paid well, and to be part of a, a great team that is searching for and striving for a higher purpose, i.e. the Super Bowl of life. Uh, and if that athlete can simply overcome the tendency towards this great narcissism, which a lot of my former teammates don't like, but um, and remember that it still ends up being the same thing, that you have to contribute and share that success, and that only then restokes your own capacities. So instead of having that Pro Bowl and the game-winning field goal like I did in 1982, where I somehow felt empty afterwards, realizing I'd left out that other piece, I was able to, at 24, 25 years of age, go, wait a minute, there are other things that matter. And I think that's, that's what we have to do. We have to mentor our athletes uh, at ever earlier ages because scots.com and rivals.com and all the recruiting agencies and all the pressure and all the money and all the things that can distort the real values and fundamental values of sport that have to do with caring about others, that have to do with competing when things are tough and overcoming adversity, that have to do with working as a great team for a larger purpose. We can't forget that's where we start with sports, but it's also that's where we end with sports. So for our students, our undergraduates, our graduate students, they may go into the fitness industry, they may manage professional teams, they may uh, go into sports law, what have you. Uh, what recommendations do you have for them so they can keep this a priority and their, their business, their pursuits can really help push this in a positive direction? Well, I, I think that when you set your goals, everybody knows that you have to have written goals, you have to have short-term and longer-term goals, and you have to work that every day. But the goals also are not just bottom-line goals. They aren't just, I made 22% more. I saw it last night, Samsung had less profit. Well, that's an interesting doublespeak because it means they still made lots of money, billions of dollars, but they made 20 or 30% less billions of dollars. So it's not really the same as losing money. And so we, we think and equate, if we're not careful, the bottom line goals with the goals that can always be fed, which are those, those goals of how do I use this, these lessons of success to compete, to perform, to focus under pressure, to be a good leader, uh, to help the team work better as a team, and then share that with whatever matters the most to me. So the, the part that is universal is that lesson. The part that is unique is that your gifts, John Elliott, are different from my gifts. Everybody has a unique gift, a unique um, passion center that we know way beyond words turns us on as human beings. And that's the part that has to be re-engaged and reinvigorated and always understood is the most important goal. So that when we reach the mountaintop of a certain goal, the Super Bowl, the you know selling of your company for X number of dollars or the big story on Time Magazine, it still is empty if the other part of it is, what do I do with this? So that others know they can partake and they can find their own Super Bowl of life as well. So it's not just the trophy, if this was a trophy and this was the Super Bowl trophy, this is only symbolic of all those things that are certainly spiritual. Heaven forbid that I mention that word on a college campus. Uh, but they're spiritual that also evoke those qualities in us that can always grow. So we feel alive. We don't die slowly over time because of, because of the success. We die in other ways that really actually are far more important. You mentioned leadership. What would you say are the most fundamentally important characteristics of a great leader? Well, I will, um, I will uh, evoke uh, some of the things I learned at Harvard with the adaptive leadership model, which is all leadership, uh, much as Alexis de Tocqueville in the 1830s uh, underscored that America was great because of its capacity to come together in small groups. All leadership is about managing the small group. So if there's a mother, a single mother that's watching this program, being a leader starts with being able to manage that small group that might be doing this during dinner and having them decide as a group to not have these phones on during dinner so at least one time every day that family is close and can communicate and talk and be connected. So uh, managing that small group, number one. Uh, number two is uh, what the, they would define leadership as, I would define as being able to resolve conflicts and values first, what's most important, 
and then the strategies. You know, we may agree in that security and adventure and success are all important, but we may have very different ideas of how to get there. And without mentioning universities, you and I have seen universities that are, uh, you know, tremendously re respected for their research and yet perhaps get caught up in the research and forget about staying open-minded to new learning as well. That's where the leader must go. The leader must step into the place carefully, but uh, aware of creating new space for new learning. And it's when we take things for granted, when we think we've reached here, we've got our PhD, that we now we know something, that we actually are doing the exact opposite. We're stopping learning. We're stopping the capacity of taking this body of knowledge and we've stopped sharing it with people that can use it where it really has its value. That's a great point. Our students, whether they're undergraduates or graduates, or they're getting their PhD, they invest so much time and they invest so much money to get that education. Yes. Um, what would be your advice so they don't fall into that trap you just mentioned? Well, it's twice as hard as, as it's ever been because the average um, money that is owed, uh, different studies go somewhere between 30000 and 50000 for undergraduates and then all the way up to graduates at a quarter million or sometimes more at $60,000 just in basic costs at Dartmouth College and uh, NYU and Ivy League schools. It'll be 70000 probably in three years. So now you want to have the vision, but you've got to pay your bills. So I guess my uh, advice would be to just write down in your goals that when you've achieved the PhD or the master's or the undergraduate degree itself, the BA, um, that life is only full, making contribution um, and giving yourself a break that uh, there will be debt. And don't let that debt skew your, your higher calling. Um, it's, it's easy to say it's hard to do, but at least by being proactive in your goals, you can manage your debt such that it doesn't become something that prevents you from having the life that you dreamed of. And don't stop learning. That when you get that degree, it's not a symbol that your learning is complete. In fact, it's just a starting point. Yeah? So we actually had a great discussion this morning with uh, some of the students here in the sports and kinesiology department. A uh, uh, wonderful book by Nassim Taleb. Uh, called um, the black swan and its basic premise is very much that that the second we think we know something because we have the degree because we've gone through adversity because we've made it to one mountaintop the second we think that's the only mountaintop the second we think we've arrived the, is the second we stop learning and the second that we stop being fulfilled as people and so yes learning for a lifetime both of us I, I, I'm not sure if you heard of the legend of Arthur Mayer, but when I was at Dartmouth my senior year, I remember Arthur Mayer, 93 years old, he would teach at Stanford in the winter and then come out to Dartmouth in the spring, and his 88-year-old wife, Millie, and telling stories, vibrant stories, uh, entertaining the audience. I want to be like that. I think everybody, we have a choice and we have great knowledge and wisdom as the elders in any society do. We have those capacities to share those things. Why ever stop? Why ever think that there's a time when that won't be the most fulfilling endeavor one can be part of? Yeah, speaking about the tacit wisdom that we have to share, um, where it comes from and how it gets transferred, you spent a great deal of time um, in Native American communities. Uh, what have you learned from that experience? <sighs> Um, well, first of all, um, Native Vision is still going on. We're in our 20th year with Johns Hopkins and the NFL Players Association, nativevision.org. Um, uh, but uh, certainly one learns that every, as difficult as problems are, in the ghetto, in the inner city, uh, on the reservation in Wyoming, in Wind River, where we've been, or on the Navajo Reservation, or this year on the White Mountain Apache Reservation, wherever that is, Children are still children, where love and encouragement and that, that mentoring role, that coaching role, that encouraging role, those are the fundamental things. We can, we can academically study things to death and go into a million details, but as long as we remember those things are what keep that sense of hope, which then inspires the engagement in life, which gives kids the chance to be great. As long as we do those things, that's, I think, what Native American leadership would say is, unlike traditional learning where there is the wizard-like figure at the front of the classroom sometimes, the Native Americans would say it's the mentoring relationship that we are always initiating ourselves and the next generation into adulthood, into a greater place, a greater state. 
Fantastic. Get out your crystal ball for a minute. If you're looking at the sports industry as it is now and you're projecting, what's it going to look like 10 years, 20 years from now? What's going to be the biggest change? Well, I'm going to go with what I hope uh, is the change, and that is that even more proactively, when NFL salaries go from 2.2 million to over 5 million in six years, when baseball salaries at 4.1 million go to $6 million in six years, when the average career, even if it's only three and a half years in football, uh, garners someone $20 million or, or you know, $15 million, there will be so many athletes that have a few million dollars that they could invest in some sort of community building activity that strikes at the core of what matters to them, that encourages other people to see that even if you're at that mountaintop, you never forget where you come from. You never forget that you have an obligation to give back. That's what makes America great, is seeing that there's a circle of success. It's when we, uh, sports propagates itself on this uh, pattern where there's more and more money and we forget the players and we forget the fans and we forget the people that can't afford season tickets and we forget the fact that um, everybody's part of this success at some level. And I think this commissioner, Commissioner Goodell, for some of the mistakes that may be perceived uh, and some of the problems with sexual assault and domestic violence and bullying and and some of the other issues that have arrived in the NFL, those are also because of the intense spotlight. And this commissioner, at least I'm seeing signs, at least the beginning of signs, of going from uh, the attempt to say this matters to us, having a community heart, to really doing great things more and more. So I see, 10 years from now, the, the foundations that players can set up, the endeavors in the community can be even more great, more significant. Um, and yet not distract the player during his career, but actually ground him even more so in his career. So if you look at that 10 years out with those potential changes or the way the direction the industry is going, the students that we have here at AM and they're graduating now, they're going to be mid-career when those changes are really taking hold. Yes. What should they be doing now to prepare to be difference makers down the road? Well. Once again, I, I may sound like a broken record, but no matter 25 or 35 or 45, the most important conversation we have in our lives is with ourselves. And the great news is, no matter how many mistakes we make, and I'll be talking about that a little bit tonight, no matter how many mistakes, uh, the learning process, uh, even in the physiology of the brain, is geared to mistakes. And as long as we learn from those mistakes, we can actually get closer to the things that make being alive and being the leader of ourselves and others more real in every moment. Uh, and adversity is the teacher that comes no matter what, no matter how perfect we've done it, there will always be adversity. There will be more adversity. All we have to do is look, uh, watch the news every day to see the, uh, the storm around this world that continues to foment. Uh, but I would say, you know, make sure that throughout that process, uh, you have increments of contribution, increments of um, reminding yourself to listen to what really you enjoy so that you don't get to that place 20 years from now where you did achieve it. You set the world record and whatever that would be, and yet it's empty because you forgot to share it with all the, the, the people that really matter. And that conversation we have with ourselves every day is the most important one. Never forget that one. Would you share with us one of the big adversities you've had in life and what you think the most important thing is you learned from that? I would say uh, the biggest adversity for me was after all those years in Kansas City, uh, winning all, some amazing awards for humanitarian work, uh, the Byron Wizard White Award, it's, uh, the, Man of the Man of the Year Award, Ten Nuts in the Year Americans Award. I still had to leave. The first year of free agency, uh, there were some knuckleheads out there that thought the kickers weren't that valuable. And um, they were only on the field for a few, a few plays. And once again, I may have succumbed to that, thinking I was too valuable. And I had to learn that I had to pull up roots and move. Uh, but I learned so much from it. One of, them, one of the lessons from that was don't leave a place for just a few more bucks. And um, in this case, it was more about not leaving a place for a few less bucks. But um, I think if I had to do it over again, I, I, I'm man enough to say I probably would have stayed in Kansas City. Um, because 
in the end, if you're in a place where you're appreciated, where you can do well, mm -hmm. where you have the chance to um, take some risks and be creative and try some things others haven't done because people have faith in you and they appreciate your abilities, that's worth so much in terms of, of enjoying life and doing what really matters to you. Mm -hmm. And to leave, to go somewhere else for 10, 20, 30 uh, percent, which some athletes are faced with um, every year in free agency, be careful that you go to a place where they'll be equally appreciative of your talents in a new system. Um, and, and I'm not saying you don't take risks and you don't leave when you don't have it where you are. It's easy to spend a lot of time evaluating a contract, negotiating a contract, all of the business decisions that right. go throughout your career. Get caught up in that and forget, wait, there are other things we need to be evaluating. The social capital you're talking about, the community relationship, those sort of things that aren't printed on that piece of paper. Mm -hmm. um, how do we keep that in mind when there are real dollars and other things at stake and then important business decisions to be made? It's extremely difficult when you're full of testosterone and you know you may be married, you may not be, but you're still young at life and you think you're, you still got the Superman syndrome. Um, it, it's hard to keep uh, aware of that and I think the head coaches and the ownership that help the players learn that, what happens is they tend to attract players that are more responsible, that see the connection that everything I do does have an impact. The littlest things, from taking 15, 20 seconds to sign an autograph for a young person who will, I'm telling you all you guys on the football team, will never forget that you took the time for them, ever. They will never forget it. But they'll also never forget it if you didn't. Right. And those little things that keep reminding you a certain humility, a certain appreciation that this young person is going to be me at some day. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are beautiful, important things to, to not forget. And we have a lot of students who um, have a passion for what goes on behind the scenes. A lot of the jobs within the sports industry that people will never see or they never realize the, what those folks are doing. Um, they have a real passion for that. They want to be successful at that. Um, they may not get the credit. Um, it may be a hard road, um, but they love doing it. What advice would you give them to be successful in all of the supporting roles in the sports industry? Well, um, excellence and craftsmanship are important no matter what you do. And um, while there will be plenty of times to go, nobody appreciates what I do, they only appreciate the superstar scoring the touchdown or hitting the three-point shot or whatever it is. But the truth is, in a good organization and in a good community, eventually that is noticed. The person that has pride in what they do and shows up uh, that Yogi Berra statement, 90% of life is showing up, is absolutely true. It's probably 95% today. I think today's students uh, have to be reminded that the ability to have the discipline and the vigilance to stay focused are the ones that will do well. That if you stay focused and stay disciplined and stay keep, uh, working uh, with, with that sense of commitment, you will eventually separate what was a one and a half or one half percent or one tenth of one percent difference over time becomes an immense difference between you and the others that can't stay consistent and delivering and showing up for work and staying vital and, and creative in their mindset when, when, no matter what they're doing. Especially in the sports industry where so many young folks want to be in sport, right? That the competition for the few jobs means you have to do two, three, four internships before you get your first job and then you've got to be willing to do all the stuff you don't want to do just to, to make it your first year and work your way up. I mean, it's a, it's a tough road. Um, you've got to stick it out, but the craftsmanship I, you know, really sticks out in your comments to me. Um, and, and frankly, at the highest level, I've had a chance to work in three different White Houses and work in the NFL, obviously. Uh, it's amazing to think 37 years since my first year out of trying to make it. Um, they're still people. And at the highest level, people still are human. And humans are flawed. And humans are not perfect. And humans make mistakes. So don't think that those people, as I did initially, which is the, the human reaction as you try to be something great, don't think that those people are that much more perfect than you are. They simply hung in there longer. And my experience with players is another example, but with coaches too, whether it's Pete Carroll, who was fired by the New York Jets after one year and then ended up being one of the 
four or five best coaches in the NFL, most people would agree. Marv Levy, fired by the Chiefs, who took the chance to cut Jan Stenner to keep me, who ended up being a Hall of Famer. I mean, uh, Marty Schottenheimer, great coach, but had problems early. Bill Belichick, fired by Cleveland, did pretty well <laughs> since. Um, everybody, as you keep learning that the adversity part uh, is always going to be there. Um, and everybody I've seen, you keep working your plan and eventually your passion will come out too. Uh, that's what's satisfying, is knowing you have a command that goes way beyond intellectual. You have almost an intuitive understanding of the right people to attract around you as well. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very important. Um, probably everybody watching that's a football fan. Um, will want to know about handling pressure. Because you as a kicker, specifically, but then you, Nick Lowry, with the success over the amount of time, arguably could say, um, best under pressure, the most amount of pressure in a single moment of anybody in the history of sport, at being able to manage that over a long time. How did you do it? Oh, I don't know. That that's not a fair statement, but thank you for saying that. <laughs> but, I can uh, make but, that argument. But certainly, um, the pressure of a place kicker is very high. And that teaches you so much. How do I manage to do it is, I think that, like Tiger Woods, early in his career, and hopefully he'll regain that, is loving the preparation. I don't think Tiger works as hard as he used to. And I think that what happened to me was, because I've been cut by eight teams in tryouts with eight teams and uh, 11 different opportunities of tryouts or being on the roster and being cut, I was so much appreciative at a higher level of the tenuous nature of my position to remember, just like I said when this, in Nassim Taleb's book, the second you think you've got to figure it figured out is the second you don't. Um, the second you come to a game and you're not nervous, that's not necessarily a good sign. Being nervous means you're invested and you realize that uh, risk and mistakes are right out there. But loving that preparation, uh, I'd say that's really what helped is making my practice, the older I got, the more experience, the more I was able to make practice like a game. Not just physically, but seeing the game situations, preparing, um, and then trusting your routine. Absolutely trusting your routine in the game. Because there are a thousand voices in your head saying, run for the hills, <laughs> or I hate my job. <laughs> and yet sticking with it, and how most of the time, letting your natural ability as a pitcher be your natural throwing motion your natural kicking motion, your natural golfing motion, letting that take over. That's what the preparation, the practice is for so that you can allow it to just be in the game. Mm, wonderful. You talk a lot about having mentors and how important it is to have mentors throughout your life. Um, of the people you've looked up to over the years, if you could leave us with one closing remark, what would be the most valuable piece of advice you ever received? Well, I'll probably go back to a man I'll mention tonight, um, Dick Johnson, who was a retired stockbroker and a clam digger from Maine. He'd say he was, he was a relief pitcher and played a little semi-pro ball, was a Golden Gloves boxer. Um, but he always, always was filled with a sense that every moment is valuable and filled with the potential to be great. And uh, the story he told me the very first time I met him, it's hard not to get emotional, I'll probably tell this story tonight, is, is just the circle of life that he had stood up for a young man who was being bullied in school week, week out, week in, for years. And he finally said, I've had enough. You guys, leave him alone. He's my friend. And on his deathbed, just a month before he met me, or six weeks before he met me, he said he literally was going to die uh, any minute. And this kid, the same age, maybe 12, 13 years of age, appeared to him and said, you know, Dick, you were there for me when no one else would be, and I've never forgotten it. So I'm honored to tell you, you're not going to die. And I think when we invest in that sense of contribution, Great voices continue to come back to us, that speak to us, and help us, remind us that life is so special and full. And that's, to me, so important. Find that person, that Dick Johnson in your life. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it.